In the previous video, while studying units, we introduced the idea of solid angle, how it captures the notion of angular spread in three dimensions. We also saw how the solid angle of a cone can be related to its half angle. But what if we need to compute the angle for a more general shape that is not as clean as the cap formed from the cone sphere intersection? That is what we seek to explore today. To recap, the solid angle of a cone of directions or tetrahedron from a point is the area it intercepts on the unit sphere. To properly visualize this, let's make the following construction. We begin by setting up the space. We have the three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system with x, y, and z axis. Now we introduce a sphere of radius capital R centered at the origin. Let's mark a point on the surface of the sphere. And in the spherical coordinate system, its coordinates can be written in terms of the radius r and angles theta and phi. Here you can see the red line from the origin to the point, which is the radial vector of length r. We are going to project this point onto the z-axis and the xy plane, that is the plane where z equals zero. The small path shown here is for your convenience to understand where the projection goes on the xy plane. Now we can define some of the angles thus formed. So the angle from the z-axis down to the radial line joining P is theta, which is also called the radial angle. And the horizontal projection helps define the azimuthal angle phi, which is measured from the x-axis. Now that we have a basic construction up, we are going to define some small changes. So firstly, we mark a tiny increment d phi on the azimuthal angle, forming a curved wedge on the base circle. Similarly, we draw d theta, a small increase in the polar angle, and this gives us a vertical sweep below the point. With these tiny increments using differential angles, we can define a small quadrilateral patch on the surface of the sphere, which we'll briefly see. First, let's project its corners onto the base for clarity while highlighting the latitude circles at theta and d theta and the longitude meridians at phi and d phi. So you see how these form the boundaries of this tiny patch and this red patch represents a tiny curved surface, the differential area on the sphere pertaining to the small increments in the radial and azimuthal angles. And what might this area be equal to? To answer that, we need to look at some distances. The horizontal distance from the z-axis to the point's projection is r sine theta. So the arc length along the base swept out by d phi is r sine theta times d phi. And the vertical edge from theta to theta plus d theta is simply r times d theta. And we can clearly see that multiplying these two dimensions will thus give us the surface area of this red patch. Okay, so let's go ahead and derive the expression for differential solid angle from this. Here in this spherical coordinate system, direction in three-dimensional space can be labeled by the pair phi and theta. And you can confirm from the figure that phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi, sweeping around the horizontal plane, and theta ranges from 0 to pi, descending from the vertical z-axis. The key question now is that if we notch both phi and theta by tiny amounts, d phi and d theta, what solid angle do we sweep out? We've already seen that the curved area element on a sphere is given by r times d theta multiplied by r sine theta d phi. And that simplifies to r squared sine theta d theta d phi. Dividing by r squared as per the definition gives us the differential solid angle d omega equals sine theta d theta d phi. This is our central result and it tells us how much angular space is covered by an infinitesimal rectangle in theta and phi. To compute the solid angle over a finite region, we now integrate. 
Since omega is a function of the variables theta and phi, we are required to compute this double integral taken over the specified bounds in theta and phi. While a double integral is something you typically encounter in a course of multivariable calculus, which is beyond the scope of our syllabus right now, what you do here simply is collect all the terms in one variable and integrate them, and then do the same for the other variable, which is simple here really, given that phi and theta are independent of each other. So you see, we finally obtain here that omega equals phi 2 minus phi 1, multiplied by cosine theta 1 minus cosine of theta 2. And we'll soon try to plug in some values and see if this can allow us to replicate a familiar result. But before that, let's look at some special cases. First, let's consider a hemisphere. We'll compute the solid angle it subtends at its center. We begin with the double integral of sine theta d theta d phi with theta running from 0 to pi by 2. And the limits simplify to 2 pi minus 0 and cos 0 minus cos pi by 2. That would give us 2 pi times 1 minus 0. So the hemisphere subtends a solid angle of 2 pi steridians. Secondly, let's consider a sphere and evaluate its solid angle again from the center. The integration here goes from theta equals 0 to pi and phi equals 0 to 2 pi. We simplify the inner integral cos 0 minus cos pi and that becomes 1 minus negative 1 or simply put 2. So we get 2 pi times 2 or 4 pi steradians. This is the total solid angle around any point in space. Finally, let's see what happens when the angle theta is very small. We start once again from the double integral form with phi ranging from 0 to 2 pi and the radial angle from 0 to theta where theta is infinitesimal. This evaluates to 2 pi times 1 minus cos theta. But when theta is small, we can expand the cosine using a Taylor series. Cos theta expanded thus equals 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus the higher order terms. And for very small angles, we can ignore these higher order terms and approximate cos theta as 1 minus theta squared by 2. We can now plug that back into the expression for the solid angle omega. And this would give us 2 pi times the quantity 1 minus 1 plus theta squared over 2 which simplifies to 2 pi times theta squared over 2, thus giving us the final result that omega equals pi times theta squared in the case of small angle theta. These are some interesting results, and I hope you can see how these three special cases help build intuition about the solid angle. Now we are going to apply what we've learned so far to see if we can replicate a familiar result. We'll compute the solid angle subtended by a right circular cone at its apex. To visualize, we place a transference sphere centered at the cone's vertex. The cone originates at the center and intersects the sphere, thus cutting out a spherical cap. This red region is the spherical cap subtended by the cone and that's the region we want to measure in solid angle. It should become immediately apparent here that the fixed half angle alpha of the cone measured from the vertical z axis to its slant edge is nothing other than the radial angle theta in spherical coordinates given our current geometry. Now from our previous results, we know that the solid angle subtended by a surface is the double integral of sine theta over the relevant bounds. In this case, phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi and theta ranges from 0 to the cone's half angle alpha. Evaluating this integral gives us this familiar result and this formula connects angular spread directly to the cone's opening and it's a direct application of solid angle element we derived earlier. Now we are ready to explore some key applications of solid angles in physics. First, in radiation physics, Solid angle helps quantify how much of a source's emission reaches a given region in space. 
Imagine a point source emitting uniformly in all directions, that is, over a total solid angle of 4 pi. If we restrict this emission to a conical region of half angle alpha, only a small portion of the rays pass through it. Suppose n rays are emitted uniformly, then the number passing through the cone is proportional to the solid angle it subtends. So rays through the cone equal n over 4 pi times omega and we can substitute omega in terms of the half angle alpha over there. This concept also leads us to define the intensity of radiation which is power per unit solid angle. The SI unit is watts per steridian and this formula applies strictly to point sources. Solid angle also appears in electrostatics, particularly in visualizing electric flux. Here we show a point charge emitting field lines radially outwards and if we isolate a conical region, the number of field lines or flux passing through it is again proportional to the solid angle. And later on, while studying electrostatics, we'll see that from Gauss law, we know that the total flux from a point charge is Q by epsilon naught. Thus, the flux through the cone would be omega over 4 pi times the total flux. And this localized version of Gauss law directly connects angular coverage to the fraction of the total electric field. Let's now apply our understanding of solid angles to a real-world physics problem. A communication satellite is placed in a circular orbit 400 kilometers above Earth's surface. And to avoid wasting energy, its antenna focuses radiation only within a specific conical region, thus subtending a solid angle omega. And we are also told that Earth is a perfect sphere of radius 6378 kilometers. In part 1, we are asked to derive an expression for the solid angle in terms of R and H and then compute its value numerically. In part 2, we'll determine what fraction of total isotropic power is saved by restricting radiation to this solid angle. And finally in part 3, we compute the angular radius of the Earth's visible disk as seen from the satellite. Let's now construct the geometry to support this analysis and figure out how to proceed. Here is the Earth, represented as a sphere. A point is placed outside the sphere and this marks the satellite's location at a height h above the surface. We draw a radial line from the Earth's center to the satellite and finally let's build the cone of coverage. Let's put this down alongside our problem. We have our Earth of radius capital R and the satellite at a distance R plus H from the Earth's center with the cone of coverage having a half angle alpha. This cone is tangent to the Earth and extends downward from the satellite. Its base intersects the Earth's surface in a circular cap and you can see the tangential lines drawn here and this geometry will help us calculate the subtended solid angle using the formula we derived earlier. Let's label all these points for convenience. The center of the Earth is at O, the satellite at point P. A and B are the points where the cone touches down on the Earth. S marks the midpoint of the line joining them. And this gives us our final geometry. We'll now solve this problem step by step. In part 1, we are deriving an expression for the solid angle in terms of R and H. To find the solid angle, we use the formula as defined earlier. Now we have that OA equals R and OP equals R plus H. Observe that the triangle OAP is a right angle triangle with the right angle at A. Using Pythagoras theorem, thus AP squared equals OP squared minus OA squared. Substituting values gives that AP is the square root of 2RH plus H squared. Now cos alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse and that's basically AP over OP. We plug in the values and simplify. Now we can substitute that back into the solid angle expression and we'd finally get 
omega equals 2 pi times 1 minus square root of 2 r h plus h squared over r plus h. And with r equals 6378 kilometers and h equals 400 kilometers, this evaluates numerically to about 4.155 steroidians. I encourage you to put in the values and check that for yourself. Let's now move to part 2. An isotropic antenna would radiate uniformly in all directions and that's basically a full solid angle of 4 pi stay radians. But here, the satellite is radiating only in this cone, which means only 4.155 out of 4 pi stay radians are being used. That's roughly one third of the space, or in percentage, that's 33%. So by narrowing the radiation, around 67% of the total emitted power is being saved. Finally, part 3. We are asked to find the maximum angular radius in degrees of the Earth's visible disk from the satellite. Since the angle alpha from part 1 also represents the cone's half angle, this is the same as finding theta, where cos theta equals square root of 2rh plus h squared over r plus h. Plugging in the values again gives cos theta is approximately equal to 0 0.3385. And taking the inverse cosine, theta is about 70.2 degrees. This problem is a perfect illustration of how geometry, solid angle integration and physics come in together in a very real world setting. Let's wrap up the video with a couple of problems for you to try on your own. In question 2, a light source is submerged in benzene. You'll use the concept of critical angle and solid angle to determine how much light remains trapped due to the total internal reflection. And in question 3, we revisit the idea of electric field lines behaving like flux. A field line leaves one charge at a known angle. Your task is to figure out the angle at which it should terminate on a second charge based on solid angle continuity. We'll go over the detailed solutions to these problems in the next video, where we'll also explore significant figures, uncertainty in measurements, and types of errors. So try them out and I'll see you there.